A loud honk sounded as the car in front of me came to a sudden stop. Something had dashed across the road. Something large. I slammed my foot down on the brakes and prayed the icy road wouldn't allow yet another fender bender. It was hard to make out any shapes through the thick veil of the blizzard's harrowing symphony, but I could tell that whatever had crossed the highway had done so with speed and precision. Maybe a moose, I had thought to myself, paying no further mind to the matter. I reclined into my seat and turned up the volume on the radio. Frank Sinatra's I've Got You Under My Skin filled the cozy insides of my SUV, and I felt my heart rate suddenly stabilize. It had been several hours since I had left my hometown, and now I was surrounded by an endless expanse of white as far as the eye could see. There should have been a forest on either side of the highway, but with these severely worsening weather conditions, it was impossible to make out anything further than six feet away. As I tapped my fingers on the steering wheel in perfect synchronization with the song, I grew more and more impatient. We had stood still for at least five minutes by now. Surely there couldn't be this much traffic all the way out here. The song was nearly over and we still hadn't moved. Behind me, I could hear a chorus of aggressive honking. There were at least six cars behind me as far as I could tell, probably six in front as well. Their headlights were the only indicator of their existence, as the snow had turned everything else invisible. And then a grisly thought spread like wildfire throughout the crevices of my mind. Had there been an accident? I sat up in my seat and made an attempt to somehow peek above the top of the car ahead of me. It was futile. What is going on? I murmured under my breath as a loud sigh escaped my body. The howling winds outside violently slammed into the exterior of the car, killing any notions that I may have had about stepping out and investigating. For now, it was best that I just waited it out. It would surely pass in a minute or so. I picked up my phone and started messing around with a few apps. I do not condone texting and driving, but considering that we hadn't been moving for a while, I would wager a short social media session couldn't hurt anyone. And besides, it didn't look like I was going anywhere anytime soon either. I even glanced over to the half-empty bottle of Jack Daniels that laid unassuming on the floorboard of the seat beside me, but I decided against it for now. Prior to this traffic jam, I had been visiting my extended family for the holidays back in my hometown. Due to reasons that we don't need to delve into, I was forced to leave earlier than I had initially expected, which was fine by me as I couldn't stand another second of chatty family drama and that awful holiday cheer. Forgive me if I'm sparse with the details, but for privacy's sake, I won't disclose the name of the town that I departed from, nor where I am currently headed. All you need to know is that the road that I was traveling on was located pretty far up in the northwestern region of the United States. It was absolutely freezing. Some time passed and the vehicles on the road hadn't moved an inch. It was as though they were rooted to the icy foundations below. Dauntingly, I observed as the car in front of me was in the process of getting devoured by the rapidly growing snowfall. Its tires were nearly completely engulfed, and I figured that it wouldn't be long until getting home in time to watch today's football game would be the least of my concerns. And then, growing in the distance, were sirens. I looked up from my phone and directed my gaze toward the side view mirror, and I saw a faint blinking blue light penetrate through the thicket of snow. The ambulance zoomed past me at breakneck speeds, and shortly after, a police car had followed. This only reaffirmed my belief that something terribly wrong had occurred. I scrolled through my phone and continued as usual, though my digital endeavors would prove to be quite fruitless. 
The longer that I used my phone, the worse the connection seemed to get. TikTok and YouTube videos began buffering, and other apps that required internet connectivity wouldn't even load. I'm by no means a physicist, a tech guru, a meteorologist, or whatever the appropriate title for this would be, but I surmise that the ongoing raging storm could be linked to the shortcomings of my phone signal. Incidentally, I was also in the middle of nowhere, 40 minutes away from the nearest settlement and three hours away from the closest city. The remoteness of my location would surely also have an impact on my... A light tapping on my window caught me off guard and I jolted in my seat. The oh, crap, I thought, as the sight of a bulky police officer greeted me on the other side of the glass. By the looks of it, he had been out in the storm for way too long. His cheeks were glowing pink, and he had snowflakes stuck in his burly mustache. I quickly stole my phone in my pocket and rolled down the window, preparing to explain why I was on my phone in traffic. But the officer didn't care about any of that. Good evening, sir. The officer started. There's been an accident further up on the road. Right now we're trying to... Could you turn that down? He gestured towards the radio. Oh, sorry officer, of course, I replied. Dialing the scroll wheel of my volume button all the way down. As I was saying, we're trying to evacuate this um, whole area. Once I've gotten to the final car at the end behind you there, and I've gotten him to start backing up, I want you to follow him immediately. You want me to drive in reverse? I questioned. A quizzical grimace stretched across my face. Now the road's too narrow right now. I don't see any other option. Unless you want to try turning around and risk ending up in one of these ditches here. The officer said with a slight smirk. But before I had the chance to say anything else, a thundering bang sounded a couple of yards in front of us. The winds carried the sound with ear-splitting accuracy. The officer reacted immediately, hovering his hand above the pistol in his holster. He took a few steps back and tried signaling in on his shoulder-mounted radio. Another bang echoed through the harsh wind, followed by another, and then another. The sounds were unmistakable. They were gunshots. He drew his pistol and rushed towards the source of the sounds. I watched as he slowly faded from view. A void of white had swallowed him whole. I stared in shock for a couple of minutes, expecting the officer to return any moment, but he never came. A small mass of snow had started accumulating inside my car, so I quickly rolled up my window. I could hear another set of muffled gunshots joining the already dominant ones. It sounded like they were completely emptying their magazines into whoever or whatever. And then in perfect unity, the sound stopped. The silence weighed heavy as I sat in anticipation. My mind was flustered with thoughts and ideas, but the prevalent feeling that occupied my body was a creepy sensation of dread. Just what the heck was going on? I anxiously tapped my fingers on the steering wheel. In a moment of weakness, I once again looked over to the liquor bottle from the floor. I hadn't gone this long without a drink in years. I mean, one sip wouldn't hurt, right? Just to calm my nerves. If I was discreet enough, the officers would have no way of knowing. Just as I leaned over to the passenger side to pick the bottle up, my vehicle violently trembled. Something powerful had slammed into my car. I cursed loudly and rose back up, abandoning the bottle. I frantically searched around, looking for any signs of the perpetrator. I scanned my rear view, the side window and even the passenger side window. Nothing but a flurry of white snow. And then I noticed something in the blizzard in front of me. A black silhouette grew larger and larger and soon I could make out what it was. A man, wait no, two men, and they were running, running towards my car. But these guys weren't police officers nor any of the paramedics that had arrived earlier. 
and they must have been the denizens of the cars up front. And then two more people appeared behind them, either giving chase to or following the two men in front. As they inched closer, I could properly see the expressions carved into their faces. They were terrified. They looked as though they had seen a ghost. The first two men ran past my car. They didn't even look at me. And shortly after, the two people behind them had followed. A woman and a boy. They hurried across the ice at great speeds while at the same time exercising caution so as to not slip and fall. Before I had the chance to react, they were gone, having once again been consumed by the endless white void. This was a definitely cause for concern. Who in their right mind would abandon the comforts of their vehicles all the way out here in this weather? The driver in front of me cautiously opened one of the doors of the car. A middle-aged white man with a beer gut stepped out into the cold. He slung his puffer jacket around his shoulders and stared off into the distance ahead. I watched him curiously, wondering if he too would start running, and then wondering whether I should join him if he indeed decided to. Right now it seemed illogical, but then again, these guys clearly knew something that I didn't. Maybe there was a gas leak up ahead. Maybe some radioactive material had been improperly disposed of. My mind raced, looking for any logical explanations for my current predicament, but I found none. The man took a few steps forward, intently inspecting the blizzard ahead. It seemed as though something had caught his attention. He took another few steps forward, positioning himself in front of his car, partially obscuring my view of him, his left side still visible. But there was something else. In the deep recesses of the snowstorm, something was moving. I strained my eyes, leaning forward in my seat and staring through my snow-covered windshield. Approaching from the left side of the road onto the oncoming lane, a large silhouette bobbed up and down as it slowly advanced toward the man. Though it was far away, it looked to be near twice his height, but he hadn't noticed it. The man was far too busy examining whatever had caught his attention directly in front of him. An overwhelming sense of dread had filled my veins. The way the silhouette moved, I couldn't quite explain why, but it felt predatory. Like a lion stalking its prey through the thick underbrush of the African savanna, right before springing into action and securing itself a fresh meal. Was it a moose? It didn't look to be. I mean, the proportions were way off, and it almost looked to be bipedal. But I couldn't think of any other large animals out here that the silhouette could have belonged to. I doubted that this area had ever seen any polar bears, and even so, they possibly couldn't reach this size. I mean, could they? It was like my primal instinct screamed at me to do something. I felt my fight or flight start to kick in, but I managed to keep it under wraps. I was safe inside of my warm SUV, but the man, however, I had to warn him somehow. If I honked my horn, whatever was stalking him might have leaped into action right away. It was way too risky. Before I could think of anything, the man screamed in terror. Muffled through my car's thick exterior, his cries echoed. I focused ahead of me, trying to get a glimpse of what had riled him up so badly. He turned around in, in an attempt to flee. He had almost made it back to the driver's side door of his car when he had planted his face into the cold, hard ground. He must have slept. The predatory silhouette to his left was nowhere to be seen now. For a brief moment, I locked eyes with the man. A familiar look of excruciating fear contoured across his face. He dug his long and unkempt nails into the snow, slowly crawling forward, and then he screamed yet again, but this time not out of fear but in pain. Violently, he was dragged back. I watched in horror as the man tried to fight it, clutching the pottery snow as if it would have actually provided a stable grip. He was dragged in front of his car and out of my view. Just before he had rounded the left side of the corner, 
I could see his blood-covered hands desperately cling to the tire. And then he was pulled away. I was in complete disbelief. It was like a scene from a horror movie, except this was real. It was actually happening. The man's wailing abruptly ceased, and besides the harsh winds of the blizzard, no sound was made. I pulled out my phone and tried my best to shake the trembling in my hands as I dialed 911. As I waited for a response, I made sure all the doors were locked well. I glued my eyes to the spot where I last seen the man. A pair of long indentations scarred the snow where he had lay, and a crimson handprint stained the black rubber of the front tire. Come on, come on, pick up already. I harshly muttered it to my phone, but I never made it past the dialing tone. Was it because I had no service? I've heard that many emergency lines still operate in spite of a poor phone signal, but right now I was inclined to believe the contrary. I eventually gave up and put my phone down. I shrunk down into my seat, making myself as small as I could. I couldn't possibly tell you how long I sat there waiting like that. The concept of time felt irrelevant at that moment. In my reclined position, I still retained a decent line of sight to the outside world. There were no signs of movement, just an empty white canvas. I could hear no discernible sounds either. I watched in what felt like slow motion as each individually unique flake of snow had landed, and then proceeded to melt onto the glass. The windshield wipers fought the blizzard vigorously, brushing aside everything the malevolent storm had to offer. And then suddenly, with a squelched thud, something heavy crashed down on the window and the wipers were now smearing a viscous red liquid back and forth across the windshield. A nearly indescribable sense of paralyzing horror drilled into my very soul as I realized what I was looking at. I immediately recognized the sorrowed eyes and contorted expression of pain that draped across the poor man's face. Glistening red blood had completely dyed his hair, and the man's skin was full of lacerations and tears. But the true horror of this scene lay not with the frightful sight that greeted me no more than 12 inches away, separated only by a cracked glass screen. Now, the true horror presented itself as I finally mustered up the courage to ponder the question that I'm not even sure I wanted the answer to. Where was the rest of them? Upon the revelation that I was gazing at a freshly decapitated human head, I was compelled to scream uncontrollably at the top of my lungs, and so I did. I couldn't help it. I felt nausea and on the verge of vomiting. It took all my strength to gather any fragment of composure that had not yet left my body, and I quickly sat up in my seat, frantically scanning my surroundings. Still, I saw nothing except a heavy downpour of snow. I tried to calm down as I knew that panicking would only worsen whatever situation was at hand. I steadied my breathing and sat still slowly counting down from ten. However, the grotesque sight that greeted me whenever I looked through the windshield it didn't exactly help. So I closed my eyes and continued counting, focusing on controlling my breathing. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. But even as I closed my eyes, I still saw his face. The gruesome image had burned itself deep into my mind and I felt anxious at the thought that I may never sleep peacefully again. In my distracted haze, I failed to notice that something foreign had filled the air, something ominous. It was a deep sound, barely audible, a stark contrast to the roaring winds outside. It was the kind of sound you feel rather than hear if that makes any sense. It was deep and bellowing, and I swear that I could feel my chest faintly vibrate like when you're at a concert or a nightclub with a really loud bass. Carefully, I rolled down my window a quarter of the way in order to better hear the curious noise. It was much clearer now, and the best way to describe it would be to call it a sort of low-pitched rumble. Its tone fluctuated ever so slightly, as if a synchronization was short, rapid breaths. 
it would be a rather powerful display of vocal cords if the sound was an organic origin. I tried my best to pinpoint the direction from which the sound had emanated, but I found the task to be near impossible. It may have been the wind distorting and dislocating the sound, but it sounded like it had originated from every direction. I didn't know what to do. Obviously, I didn't want to exit the car and make a run for it like the previous motorist before me, but I felt that staying inside the car would only render me a sitting duck. I had no weapons to protect myself either, not even a pocket knife in the glove compartment. The only thing that I had was an old Zippo lighter which I doubted would do any real damage in a fight. The deep rumbling subsided and was instead replaced by a hooting sound, reminiscent of that of an owl, only much deeper. Like if someone blew air into a hollow tree trunk. But the sound was not easy to pinpoint, and I could discern that it was coming from behind the car in front of me, where I had last seen the man before his untimely demise. I fixed my gaze toward the source of the sound expecting to see its owner peeking around the edges of the vehicle at any moment, when I suddenly heard another, identical set of deep hooting coming from my left side. I wondered how the animal or creature or whatever it was that made those sounds had somehow managed to sneak past my line of sight and position itself to my left without me noticing. But my wondering was cut short when the original set of hoots in front once again started bellowing through the winter air, as if in response to the other ones. And to my utter dismay, I slowly began to realize that whatever was making those sounds, whatever had killed that man was not alone out here. And that's when I first saw it. As if on cue, I noticed the dominant silhouette standing in at the middle of the road contrasting itself against the rushing snowfall. Slowly emerging from the harrowing blizzard just a few yards away from the car ahead, the creature revealed itself. It was unlike anything that I had ever seen before, an abominable middle finger to all of God's creations upon this earth. Its skull resembled that of a crocodile resting over ten feet above the ground. It also had a larger crest fixated right over its eyes, reminiscent of the horns of a bull. Its razor-sharp teeth were stained red and blood dripped down from its maw and onto the snow-covered asphalt. The entire creature was covered in dense white fur like that of a polar bear. No wonder I hadn't spotted it until now. It was perfectly camouflaged among the powdery white snow. The rest of the body was hard to make out due to the storm, but I could tell that it was huge and easily towering over the vehicle that it slowly approached. It moved closer, trotting towards me in a jagged fashion. Red still dripped from its malformed mouth. It almost looked to be smiling. Almost. I looked around the cabin of the car once more desperately scouring for anything that I could use to defend myself. Except for the bottle of liquor that I had laying about, I was at a loss. At least I could ease the pain of being torn limb from limb by having a little alcohol in my system, I thought to myself. Seeing the creature uncomfortably close now, I made an attempt to just drive away. It was true what the officer had said previously about the road being extremely narrow, but in the face of certain death, I figured it was worth a shot. Though as I was boxed in by both a car in front and one in my rear, I would have to succeed at the difficult maneuver in order to make an escape. A maneuver I wasn't too sure I could make in these perilous conditions, but I had to try. I applied my foot down onto the gas pedal, and the tires spun around in the snow, slinging bits of debris everywhere. Still stationary, I pressed down even harder, hoping to God that I would break free from my frozen constraints. In my panic, I gazed ahead and locked eyes with the creature. I could feel its wicked stare burrow deep into my soul. The wheels kept spinning, but I wasn't making any progress. I had waited too long. It was what I had feared earlier. I was trapped and there was nowhere to go. An ear-splitting hoot sounded just a few yards away and I saw the creature had stopped in its tracks. It raised its head and let out another hoot. What do you want? I sobbed, punching the steering wheel in frustration. The wretched thing cocked its head, and it let out another vocalization. 
It was as if it wanted to grab my attention or to distract me. Before I knew it, I felt a searing pain aching throughout my body and my world was turned upside down as a powerful force had slammed into the left side of the car, sending it flying. The SUV toppled over, accompanied by the sounds of crushing metal. Thankfully, I was wearing my seatbelt or else I would have probably broken my neck while tumbling around inside the car like dirty laundry in a washing machine. The car eventually came to a stop. I found myself suspended upside down in the driver's seat. The vehicle had rolled down into the nearby ditch on the side of the road. Below me on the inside of the car's roof were fragments of shattered glass and heaps of snow. I hadn't quite processed what had happened so I sat there for a moment, taking it all in. Suddenly, everything felt so calm and quiet. I questioned if I had even survived the ordeal. A warm liquid flowed down my chin into my mouth and then down the rest of my face. The stinging copper taste made me snap out of my trance and I began to assess the situation. Outside, I heard heavy thuds rapidly approaching the vehicle. Each mighty stomp struck down into the snow with rhythm, and I could imagine the creature's mouth practically foaming at the prospect of a fresh new meal. The footsteps came to a sudden halt right outside of the driver's side window, and I turned my head to get a better look. A set of two large and powerful hind legs stood mere inches from my face. They were covered in what looked to be reptilian-like scales, lined with a dense white fur. And the creature had three long talons that protruded from each foot. The deafening scraping of metal filled the air, as I imagined the creature began clawing away at the undercarriage of the SUV. From the fast-paced shifting of the monster's feet, I began to understand the sheer ferocity with which it attacked. It was going ballistic, straightening the exterior at an incredibly fast rate. A combination of hoots and growls escaped its bloodthirsty jaws as it chipped away at the metal. It wouldn't be long until it was through. Another pair of heavy footsteps stopped just a short distance away on the opposite side of the car right outside of the passenger side window. Like its predecessor, it too began clawing and kicking at the body of the car. The two creatures were relentless. I had never seen anything like it. Not even wild hyenas were this ravenous. I braced for impact as I unbuckled my seatbelt, positioning myself in such a manner so that I wouldn't break my neck upon impact. I hit the ground hard and was greeted by the sensation of cold snow and broken glass. The car rocked back and forth as the creatures violently attacked. It was obvious that I couldn't stay in here for long, but escaping the crushed remains of my vehicle and running out on foot didn't seem favorable either. I felt a deep desperation begin to set in as I realized that I would most likely not live to see another day. This was it. Just as all hope had faded in, I began to accept my fate. My arm brushed up against a cold and oblong object. I shifted my body around to see what it was, and a light bulb had ignited inside my head as I gazed upon the still intact bottle of liquor that laid on the floor. My hands trembled as I reached deep into my pocket and I extracted my old Zippo lighter. However, I examined the Jack Daniels and gauged that the contents inside would not be enough for the powerful reaction that I was hoping for. So I opened the glove compartment and I began searching. Ah, there it is. I cheered as my fingers grazed upon the bottle of scented hand sanitizer, an old relic from the pandemic. It was nearly full as well. I opened the two bottles and began pouring the disinfectant alcohol down into the half-empty liquor bottle. The sanitizer mixed in with the strong bourbon and it would surely be enough for an improvised Molotov cocktail. I ripped up a piece of cloth from my shirt and stuffed it down the bottleneck. With the Molotov in hand, I crawled toward the cracked windshield. I spun around and pressed my feet against the shattered glass frame. In an adrenaline-infused state, I pressed my legs down and applied pressure to the windshield. I strained my body and pushed my legs harder than I had ever done before in my life, wishing that I had spent more time at the gym prior to this. Due to its severely damaged condition, 
It didn't take long before the windshield came off, and the harsh winds of the outside world filled the cabin of the upside-down car. Above me, the creatures growled and bellowed, ripping and tearing away at the framework. I could see narrow slivers of light begin to penetrate the underside of the car, meaning that they were nearly through. I crawled through the new opening and out into the unforgiving blizzard. I feared that as soon as I stepped outside, one of the creatures would promptly place my head in its jaws and I'd be done for. But that never came. It seemed that they were too preoccupied with getting through the hard exterior of the SUV, and they had failed to notice that I had made my crafty escape. I kept crawling along the snow, praying to God that the beasts wouldn't turn their hideous heads and discover the easy meal slithering away right beside it. I didn't dare look back either. I couldn't bring myself to face the abominable animals. Once I had achieved a satisfactory distance away from the car, I finally turned around and rose to my feet. I ignited my lighter and set the Molotov cocktails ablaze. Don't try this at home, by the way. With all my remaining strength, I hurled the flaming bottle at the heap of scrap metal that used to be my car, and I watched in glory as the fire began to rise. I even think that I hit one of the creatures as I heard a dazzled yelp cry out. The flames weren't nearly big enough to cause a massive explosion or anything, but it was just enough to distract the creatures so that I was able to make a run for it. I ran back out onto the road and continued past all the vacant cars that stood further up. The ice was painted red and a couple of human bodies, or at least what remained of them, were strung about the various abandoned vehicles. Eventually, I came upon the ambulance in the police car that had arrived about an hour prior. There were no signs of the officer who had talked to me, but deep down I knew what kind of fate had befallen him. In the distance, I heard ominous rumbling sounds coming from one of the creatures, followed by agitating hooting. And they finally noticed that I was gone, and in that case, I didn't have a lot of time. I got inside the ambulance and planted myself down in the driver's seat. A frozen and severed human hand was attached to the wheel. I gagged as I ripped it off and tossed it out the open window. The creature's shrill cries echoed through the snowstorm, and it sounded like they were coming closer. Desperately, I turned the ambulance's ignition and to my delight it started up without a hitch. I kicked my foot down on the gas pedal and floored it out of there. Luckily for me, ambulances in this part of the U.S. come well equipped to handle hazardous terrain and snow-covered roads. As I drove, I intently watched the rearview mirror hoping that I would get a last glimpse of one of the monsters, but the only things I saw were whirling snowflakes, dancing effortlessly along the icy winds that carried them. About 30 minutes of driving later, I arrived at a small town. The blizzard had begun to let up and the sun was starting to set on the horizon. I parked outside the first roadside hotel that I found and must have looked like a zombie as I frantically begged the receptionist to alert the authorities. She looked extremely nervous but did as I told her. After a while of talking, the kind receptionist informed me that the police would stop by first thing in the morning. Apparently, the nearest station was an hour's drive away and the raging storm had caused major problems across infrastructure over all the state. Seeing as how nobody was in immediate danger, they would wait until the roads were cleared and they could travel safe again. I wasn't happy with this response, but I was too tired to really care. I checked into one of the hotel rooms and began typing all of this out on my phone. There are still so many questions left unanswered, but I imagine tomorrow will bring more news about the situation. I just hope that the other motorists along that highway made it out okay but I have my doubts about it. The blizzard is now subsided and outside my second story window, I'm treated to a view of the clear night sky and the endless expanse of the tundra. I'll admit this landscape is beautiful, though it is a shame that I will now forever associate the tranquility of snowfall with the abhorrent horrors of events prior. However, that is not all. Since it was getting hot in my room, I decided to crack my window slightly ajar. For the past hour, I've been listening to the breeze floating across the frozen countryside. 
There are no sounds of wild animals out here. Oddly enough, but there is something else. Occasionally in the distance, the silence is broken by the ever so familiar and foreboding sound of a faint hoot crying out into the night. <laughs>